be seated, church. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. And uh, Dr. Day, it's good to see you bouncing back from COVID. So praise yes, God sir. for that. Praise God. Aren't you grateful? Praise him again. Aren't you grateful? Uh, as I stand here, um, this is Martin Luther King weekend. I'm preaching today from Ephesians 2. Today's message is a biblical theology of race and unity. And I'm standing behind a pulpit uh, that Martin Luther King once preached behind. And I used to pastor the Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, pastored by Dr. Lee Robertson for over 40 years. And uh, at that church's peak, they had uh, all kinds of preachers. Uh, even Ronald Reagan uh, stood behind this pulpit once. But when we sold that, that church property in downtown Chattanooga and relocated the church, we had a big estate sale, and I bought the pulpit. So uh, I, I preach behind this typically about once a year. There are a few people in our church who uh, sat under Dr. Robertson's uh, ministry with this pulpit, uh, including the Beagles in this service, and uh, just an awesome, awesome thing. Um, what a beautiful... Uh, opportunity to, to experience that history. You know, when we're preaching about racism, there are landmines everywhere, and I'm sure that you've thought about some of them leading into today's service. <laughs> um, there are opportunities to offend every single one of you, of every ethnicity, and I understand that and embrace that. Uh, the gospel is offensive sometimes, church. Uh, I'm trying hard not to oversimplify this topic. I'm by no means an expert on the topic of racial relations, uh, but I'm a servant of God trying to exposit uh, the text to the best of my ability uh, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I want to make something really, really clear, and it's this, that every single person matters to God and is equally loved by God. Jesus Christ loves you equally, no matter if you are black or white or of any other skin color. And another area I want to make super clear at the outset of this message is I am not preaching today about the topic of social justice. And the reason why is because justice needeth no antecedent. God is just. Uh, I've heard it said that unity is the absence of difference, or unity isn't the absence of difference, it's the absence of division. And despite uh, differences in ethnic backgrounds uh, from various people in our lives and our community, I'm going to seek unity as a big part of this sermon today. Uh, I'm really, really grateful to get to preach this. The simplest way to stop racism is to stop hating others and to start unifying under the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. There's a statement that I'm going to say, and then I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me if you believe it, okay? The statement is, I commit to extend the love of Christ to all people. So if you believe that, you repeat that with me. I commit to extend the love of Christ to all people. That's a big, big deal. My preference is really not even to talk specifically about race. It's more so ethnicity, if you get down to the specificity of it. Uh, Adam and Eve are... Uh, from the human race. Now, there are a couple of things that we don't know about Adam and Eve, one kind of silly, one serious. We don't know if Adam and Eve had belly buttons. You've never thought about that, have you? I don't think that they do. They did, but Autumn, you liked that, didn't you? Okay. But we don't know if they had belly buttons. Also, we don't really know what their skin looked like. We don't know. But... Uh, we do know that they were the beginning of the human race, created in the image of God. 
The word ethnicity is more accurate than race, and it's uh, for the purposes of our conversation, I'll use that word as much as possible, but we're, we're all part of the human race. We're from a multitude of ethnic backgrounds. So with all that being said, as a point of introduction, I want to uh, read verses 14 through 18. If you have your Bible, I teach out of the English Standard Version. He himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near for through him we both have access in one spirit to the father um, racism is a subcategory of the spirit of division and the spirit of division comes in a multitude of styles and subsets Satan loves division but racism is a subcategory of division. It's not just about black and white people. We're, we're talking about Asian people. I grew up in a community with a lot of Asian people. And the racial tensions in my hometown of Plano, Texas, were much more so between Asian and white people than there were black and white people. Um, think about Hispanic people. Asian people, black, white, whatever. Racism is a spirit, and spirits are pervasive. Uh, spirits are really infiltrating our country right now. This is the week of uh, the transition of power in our country, and I guarantee you there are going to be all kinds of uh, evil activities, demonic activities taking place in our country. We need to be on board for that. I hope that you're in the midst of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We're on day 17. Uh, it's kicking me between the eyes. I don't know about you. Um, but America does have a racism problem. So why are we bringing this up in church today? Because I personally know people, this is a pretty tender thing for me to, to discuss here, I personally know people who proclaim Jesus as Lord, but are racist. And earlier in my ministry, I had... The man I really consider to be my Timothy in the ministry, his name is Ace Stafford. Ace is an African-American uh, man, and uh, he started out as an intern with me, uh, was called into the ministry under me. I was able just to bring him along. He eventually became our part-time youth minister, full-time youth minister, then full-time associate pastor. He was my right-hand man. Then I, I moved to pastor another church, and then uh, everything seemed fine. Everybody seemed to be on board, I thought. And then all of a sudden, when we showed his picture on the screens in the service, that's when things got rocky. And at, at that church, uh, we would vote on hiring all ministry staff, just like we do at Thomasville Road. And when we had the time for the vote, 12 people stood up and walked out. And they had made it clear to me in advance of that vote that a big reason why they didn't want to hire him was because he's black. And I was shocked because, call this my naivete, I just didn't really realize racism was as much of a thing. Call that a white ignorance? I don't know. I was ignorant about it until I experienced that. Um, but we're talking about this in church today because racism is not just on the streets of Minneapolis or Atlanta or Louisville or Washington. Uh, it's just an issue that people have. And I'm not saying everybody's a racist, but I'm saying that there are some people who are racist, okay? By the way, we needn't be flippant about calling people racist. It's a very serious accusation, all right? Um, so we need to go to the Bible and hear what the Word has to say about racism and not just what the world has to say about it. So, with all that being said, I want to give a little bit of background to this Ephesians 2 passage that we just read. So, we have Paul, 
What was Paul's ethnic background? Paul, a Jewish man. He was writing to Gentiles. And he's telling the Gentiles that because of the work that Jesus has done on the cross, they are no longer to be considered second-class citizens. They are just as close to God as a man with Jewish heritage. So Paul's communicating that Gentiles are a part of the faith that was promised to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants. All right, so that just gives a little bit of background to it. Now, I'm going to give you five points this morning. I hope that you write them down. Those of you watching online, please do write this down. Number one, and this is something I learned from David Platt preached a sermon three years ago at uh, Together for the Gospel Conference, and he made this point, and I thought it was so strong, I needed to clarify this to our congregation as well. I just wanted to give credit where it's due. But consumerism that has overtaken churches is causing walls to be built. Consumerism that has overtaken churches is causing walls to be built. Um, can I just give you a little bit of behind-the-scenes pragmatism about how to grow a church? Short term. The easiest way to grow a church is to appeal to the preferences of people. To develop a service around people and then invite God to come instead of building a service around God and then inviting people to come. The way that Dr. Day and I pray about developing these services and Courtney Vincent and uh, Nick Horner and all of our media and worship and uh, preaching team together, we're, we are developing a service based around the presence of God and begging the presence of God to come and then hoping people will be drawn to the presence of God. Okay? But if you surround people with people who look like them, talk like them, act like them, the results are that you'll grow more quickly, but it also results in extreme judgmentalism. Homogeneity grows churches' numbers more quickly in the short term and creates increased landmines for racism and blindness in the long term. And if we're going to grow in spiritual health as a congregation, we've got to put aside personal preferences in order to reach all people in Tallahassee. Secondly, get your ameners ready if you believe this. Jesus breaks down walls of division. I'm going to say some names, and I want you to ponder what nerve is struck in your heart when you hear these names, okay? Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Martin Luther King. What nerve is struck when you hear those names? Your response should ultimately be however Jesus would respond in his heart to those names. And this is the point in the sermon where it starts to get tender in the service. Because you start mentioning those names, listen, how would Jesus, Jesus tears walls down? Okay? Okay? Because I know some, some people, when you, you hear those names, you think, oh, well, my opinion on police, this or that. How would Jesus respond to hearing those names? And I want to encourage you to check your heart. Ephesians 2, 14 says, he himself is our peace. You want peace in our hearts as a community? You bring Jesus into our community because he is our peace. Peace in Tallahassee when it comes to racial relations will come when Jesus is the center of Tallahassee. Christ knew the only way to end hostility on earth was to bring his peace to us. So all of Ephesians 2.14 says, He himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. 
So walls of division were built up by the Jews for years and years against the Gentiles, okay? And they had to stay separated in order to have fidelity toward God with all of their laws and all that stuff. And now we have Gentiles who see Jesus in Ephesians 2. They say, you know, I want Jesus. And Paul uses... Uh, really his Jewish background to make sure that Gentiles have equal rights in the kingdom of God. Paul is breaking down racial walls by pointing people to Christ in Ephesians 2. If the wall of hostility was removed from the Jews and Gentiles, then there is no way there should be walls of hostility between blacks and whites and Hispanics and Asians and Indians and you name them. Number three, Jesus created a new group. He created a new group. Look at verse 15. It says, By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Now, we can learn here, if you, if you look at this, you cross-reference. I want you to just mark in the, in the margin of your Bible in Ephesians 2.15, I want you to mark a cross-reference to Matthew 5.17, okay? So you should really cross-reference those two verses, Ephesians 2.15, Matthew 5.17, because in Matthew 5.17, it teaches us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, and so Jesus filled himself up with the law, with the Torah, and he showed us how to walk out the law, how to live out the law. Look at, uh, look at Matthew 5.17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them. So what was torn down in that situation? The ordinances communicated around such laws were torn down. Jesus never broke the laws of the Torah, okay? This is really important theology for you to grasp. And I want you to again look at Ephesians 2.15. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Anecdotally speaking, it seems to me that when people are living in the flesh, they become querulous. What's that word mean? That means they're prone to picking apart stuff, fighting, being mean. And querulousness is a part, and you say, why are you using this? It's the only word I could think of that could grasp it in one word. Something that is picking apart and fighting and just overall being mean. And when, when you think about this point, that Jesus created a new group, Jesus does not stand for any attitude like that, which results in things like racism or other disunifying perspectives of life. Jesus came not to just drop off some peace, but to himself be peace, which in turn makes peace. So Jesus is the embodiment of peace, right? Would you agree with that? Give me an amen if you concur. All right. Those of you online, type an amen in the comments section. Now think about this. All right, so Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the embodiment of peace, according to Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. So if he is peace, we also know that we are to be identifying ourselves as followers of Christ. That's our identity. Think about the introduction, James 1, 1, the introduction of James. Now, James was the half-brother of Jesus. He could have identified himself as, yeah, that's my half-brother or something like that. No, he, he immediately starts to identify himself as a follower of Christ, a bondservant of Christ. And I, I've noticed a little, this is something very subtle that, that happens in the world that has happened racially, sexually as well. People have started to identify themselves in the LGBT movement as their sexuality defines them. That if I'm, I, my identity is as a straight man, or your gender defines you, 
or your skin color defines you. I do not identify as a white, straight male. I identify as a follower of Christ. Okay? So if we identify as a follower of Christ, everything else that would be a wall is broken down. And the world is really trying to build up these walls of you identify as your sexual orientation, you identify as your skin color, you identify as whatever gender you pick out. And and the truth is, you identify as a follower of Christ if you are a follower of Christ. That's it. The world is trying to build up walls. Christ came to break down these walls and to bring peace. So Jesus created a new group, and he sought to break down walls. Satan loves division. And if Satan, <laughs> I, I thought about this. I, I heard um, a, a preacher named Tim Ross talk about this. was a great point that he made. If Satan, were a math, if, if Satan were a teacher, he'd be a math teacher, and he would specialize in teaching division. That's, that's a God's honest truth. My hope is that we get back to being Bible-based in how we describe ourselves to this world. I want the world to look at Thomasville Road Baptist Church and to say, how in the world are you guys getting along so well with people of various ethnicities? And for us to be able to point to Christ because God created a new group. Number four, Jesus reconciled all. Jesus reconciled all. Let's now move on in our exposition of the text to Ephesians 2, 16. Verse 16. It might reconcile us both to God and one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility Give me an amen if you agree with this statement, okay? There's a lot of hostility in America right now. Okay. We can agree on that, I think. And if you don't agree with that, then I wish I had your attitude or your Pollyanna perspective. But verse 16, it says, I'm, It might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. I'm going to say something right now, and it might offend some of you, and I don't mean it to purposely offend, but I'm just going to speak a little, a little bluntly right now. All right, here it is. There is no such thing as true racial reconciliation. You say, what what do you mean by that? There's no such thing as true racial reconciliation. Well, I understand what's meant by the phrase racial reconciliation, but true racial reconciliation is a pipe dream. You just got very quiet in here. Why do I say that? Here's why. You think about this very logically. When something is reconciled, It's restored to its previous relationship, right? White and black people did not have that when America was founded. We don't want the relationship between black and white people to be restored to its relationship that it had when America was founded. Reconciling something brings it back to its original relationship. So think about this. Slave owners had slaves. The slaves were the workforce. They were the labor force. And that simply cannot be reconciled. I wish it could. But if we want unity amongst people of all ethnicities, we cannot just tear down one another and judge one another, we have got to go to God. And only when we are reconciled unto God can we have the ending of hostility toward one another.
The reason I brought up the preacher Tim Ross a moment ago is because an illustration that he said in his sermon about racism, I thought that happened exactly to me, and I want to tell you what happens. So I've got my little redhead down here, Autumn. She's nine. My six-year-old, Lily, can you believe it? Every once in a while, they don't get along with one another. (laughs) I know you haven't had that with your kids. I'm just saying uh, it happens from time to time. And so sometimes they'll bicker. I'll try to let them work it out amongst themselves. But once it gets pretty loud, I have to say, Autumn and Lily, come here. And then they come to me, and Lily will try to hide behind Autumn's leg. And when they're in their daddy's presence, hear me, when they're in their daddy's presence, they realize, oh no, We shouldn't have been fighting because it got daddy's attention. And now that I'm in the room with my dad and I am reconciled back to my relationship with my father, I realize that this is actually my sister. There is a a spirit of division that is so attached to so many churches that goes back to the way the churches were built around the preferences of people that has caused walls of division to be built. And building a church around the preferences of people will result in people coming to a service and expecting to be catered to instead of all of us catering to God. And we leave here picking apart sermons and music, and I'm guilty of it as well, attending services. We've all done it, right? Going back to the illustration with my girls, This spirit is still attached to so many churches because although you are in the house of God, you may not be in the same room as your father. It's only when you come back in the room with your father will you be able to see who is your sister and who is your brother. Ephesians 2.16, again, it says, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. I close out with this fifth and final point. This is a point of application. Intentionally engage with people of all ethnic backgrounds. James 1.19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So get to know people from all different backgrounds. I also encourage you to, to read people of all different backgrounds. Whatever you consume, make sure it's not just homogenous. It's not just people who look and sound and talk like you. I've even done this in my missiological reading of late. Adoniram Judson is often referred to as the first American missionary. But it's interesting that that 30 years before Judson went to Burma, George Lyle went to Jamaica to go plant churches, and George Lyle was a black man. And he faced fierce persecution. And I encourage you to read people like George Lyle if you want to be inspired about how you can reach people despite persecution because those days of persecution are only going to increase as the day draws near. This message has been a very difficult one for which to prepare, very difficult one to proclaim, but I pray that it's been done with a heart of humility and a desire to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And your ministry coming out of this is to be a unifier under the cross of Christ despite racial and ethnic differences in our community and in our country. 
I would be remiss to say I especially want to reach out to those of you who are not white, either in here or watching online. And I want you to know, although this church is pastored by a white man, it doesn't matter what color your skin is when you come to Thomasville Road. And I told Dr. Day this when we were hiring him, that we were hiring him not based upon his skin color, but there aren't a whole lot of guys who have a, a PhD in music from LSU and dean of the school of music at a seminary and worship pastor at one of the largest churches in Florida. Not a lot of those guys were across our plate. He was hired because he was by far the most qualified candidate. And um, we don't make decisions around here just to please people of whatever color your skin is. We, we make decisions around here to please God. And speaking of pleasing God, can I ask you, in your heart of hearts, are you pleasing God for eternity by having given your life over to Jesus Christ as your Savior? If he's the bringer of peace, he's the one who breaks down walls of division, then today you need to make sure you've given your life to Christ. And the way that you do that is by saying, Dear Lord Jesus, I, I'm so sorry I've, I've sinned against you. I really am sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. 